Hello, everybody. Um, before I start today's um, presentation, I have a few questions just to gauge where we are at the room. So, by a show of hands, how many of you in the room would consider climate change as one of the most defining issues of our time? Okay, and how many of you would consider gender-based violence an ongoing pandemic? That's good. But how many of you have actually ever considered or thought or read about how gender-based violence and climate change are related in some way or form? I thought so. And that's probably because a majority of the communities that are directly affected by this conference of issues are mostly marginalized in the general conversation about climate change that we're having more and more on a global level. I myself am not a direct victim of these two issues. However, over time, I've been sensitized to their relationship. And I feel like today, some of the ideas I've gathered while studying and understanding this relationship are ideas worth sharing with you, not just about these two issues, but generally how we tackle and think about global issues as a global community. So allow me to share with you a few stories here and there about how exactly I was sensitized to these two issues. A year ago, I had the opportunity to research and speak on a topic of choice for a class project. It so happened that at this same time, Kenyans on Twitter were knee deep in a heated debate, considering a particularly violent event that had just occurred, which could be connected to the issue of gender-based violence. As are all Twitter debates, it was highly polarized. One end of the debate was arguing that it was this young lady's fault for putting herself in a situation to be violently attacked. On the other hand, others like myself were adamant that this incident was what we needed in order to finally speak about gender-based violence as a social, political, and economic problem. And so, engulfed in this anger as well, I decided to base my project on the beliefs that enable gender-based violence predominantly in African communities. However, as I stand here today looking back, there was one key loophole in my research, and that's that it was confined to some of the more easier to think about points that enable gender-based violence, like patriarchal gender norms or the social taboo about speaking about gender-based violence in public spaces. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with viewing these points and understanding these points because they are fundamental towards understanding the issue of gender-based violence. However, they also have the tendency to make us look at gender-based violence from a single perspective, which could be very dangerous. Three years before this assignment was given, I was introduced to the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, who is an American lawyer, civil rights activist, and black feminist who coined the term and the study of intersectionality. Crenshaw defines intersectionality as the study of overlapping or intersecting social identities and how this relates to systems of oppression, discrimination, and domination. In a nutshell, intersectionality seeks to understand how different social identities like race, gender, class, nationality, and other social and cultural aspects of identity influence how different people experience oppression. So I still haven't answered my initial question of how I exactly landed at being sensitized towards the relationship between climate change and gender-based violence. A few months ago, I was going through my Twitter and I came across an interview that had been, an interviewer that had written down a thread about an interview he had held with a young lady who had just been displaced from her ancestral home due to prolonged droughts. In this thread, he aimed to highlight the key nuggets that he had picked up throughout his conversation. And in one of his final questions, he asked this young lady what she believes governments and global organizations should be doing in order to not only to combat climate change, but to safeguard the societies and the communities that are directly affected by climate change and its consequences. 
In the next few tweets, I expected to read a response of how outlining how governments should provide funding or some programs that allow them to have access to basic amenities as they rebuild, rebuild their lives, which are all very genuine requests. However, her response was along the lines of the failure of the global community to understand how much more violence women and girls in these affected communities were facing now that their lives had been completely uprooted and they were looking for new ways to start life again. As I was reading this, the question that kept going in my head was, why wasn't this story making headlines? Why was the conversation on climate change so one-sided? And then, over time, I realized, is it because the communities that are generally affected by climate change and gender-based violence are communities from racial and ethnic minorities who generally come from small, rural, and indigenous communities and are generally low-income areas that more often than not come from the global south? And how are all these aspects of their identities making them such a marginalized group in such a growing conversation, however, they were feeling the impacts directly? As I was trying to wrap around my head between these issues, I happened to be reading a book by a renowned political thinker, Francis Fukuyama. And he said something about intersectionality that I found extremely profound and put this issue into perspective. He said, Intersectionality is something that is in the first instance understood by people actually occupying these in intersections and not by larger communities. Let's just take a moment to let that sink in. And now let me ask you a few questions to help us fully contextualize this. Is there a reality that you occupy in your day-to-day -day life that you feel like the larger community around you is so detached from? For me, my answer is yes. I'm a black African woman living in Europe. And every single day, there's something I go through or there's a reality that I occupy that I know the larger community around me has just cannot relate to. So if your answer was yes, how would it make you feel if the larger community around you sensitized themselves and educated themselves about their reality? What if they used their privilege of belonging to the larger community to redirect conversation and awareness towards your reality? Today, that's what I want to do. I want to use my privilege of belonging to the larger community where climate change is concerned to direct awareness and conversation towards communities that are most vulnerable to climate change, but more specifically towards the women and girls in these vulnerable communities and the increased rates of violence that they're exposed to. So let's go into a bit more of the technical aspects of what I want to talk to you about today. The United Nations Women Organization defines gender-based violence as harmful acts directed at an individual or group of individuals based on their gender, with women and girls being affected disproportionately. But how disproportionate is this? According to further studies that have been conducted by the World Bank, one in three women is estimated to experience some form of gender-based violence in their lifetime. Let's fully contextualize this and have a look around this room. It is estimated that one in three women in this room will or has already experienced some form of gender-based violence in their life. With this one in three statistic, I hope we've reached some form of consensus about the second question I asked at the beginning. So let's try it again. How many of you in this room would consider gender-based violence an ongoing pandemic? Now let's shift a bit to climate change. The United Nations defines climate change as long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns. More often than not, we know climate change has been manifesting itself in things like prolonged droughts or severe floods and maybe unexpected weather cycles. But climate change has also been manifesting itself in displacement, in gender-based violence and economic instability. Climate change is not just an economic and environmental issue. It is a social and political issue as well. Today, to help us paint a picture about how exactly climate change and gender-based violence are related, I'm going to use the two instances of climate change caused displacement and economic instability to hopefully draw a more vivid picture for everyone here. 
Right now, if you were to go to your basic news source, or where you get your news from, it's not as surprising to hear about a certain region suffering disproportionately from floods or from droughts. But have you ever wondered why the conversation ends here? More often than not, the response to this will be, global leaders are reinforcing and are recommitting towards combating climate change. That's the end of the story. Very rarely are the populations that are directly affected by these issues humanized. If at all we hear about them, we hear about the number of casualties or mortalities that were recorded, and that's where the conversation ends. However, according to a report that was done by the United Nations Refugee Agency, in 2019 alone, 24.9 million people from 140 different countries were displaced due to weather-related disasters. A further study that was conducted by the United Nations Environment Office found that 80% of women, 80% of climate refugees rather, were women as of 2022. When people become climate refugees, they generally end up living in shelter or camp-like conditions, which are rarely unregulated, and everyone is trying to do the best that they can with the minimal resource available to rebuild their lives. However, in these instances, especially where resources are few and far between, women and girls find themselves in extremely exploitative relationships. This is where we see issues like transactional sex happening or extremely early child marriages. And even in more extreme circumstances, we see issues of human and sex trafficking taking place. But what if in the next climate change summit or panel that we're gonna so widely hear about, something was done to maybe create a list of minimum living standards for climate refugees, or frameworks were put in place to enhance and enforce their human rights. I mean, global warming and climate change is a global responsibility, and so how come we're not able to enforce global responsibility towards dealing with these issues? Let's look at economic instability as well. Everyone in this room is reliant on some form of income. For some of us, it's our parents. For others, it's a job that you may have. Others, it's some investments that you have. If I was to challenge you right now to think about the top three threats to this income source being completely cut off for whatever reason, for how many of you would climate change be one of the top three reasons your income is all of a sudden cut off? That's the same for me. Climate change had never been something that I've ever had to think about. However, as we have seen earlier, most of the communities that are affected by climate change are generally small rural and indigenous communities that are low income and generally rely on subsistence farming in order to make ends meet. Just to understand how reliant they are, Sub-Saharan Africa alone contributes 95% to rain-fed agriculture all around the world. So with this, you can imagine that one missed raining cycle has the, op has the possibility to completely annihilate most economic ecosystems in such communities. For these communities, however, climate change is the main threat to their income sources. And the thing about climate change is that it's not going away tomorrow. So climate change is a consistent threat towards these. If we look back at your income as well, we might say, fine, your income does help you, you know, pay your rent, get food. But in some ways, it also contributes to your happiness. It contributes to your ability to probably sleep at night and know that tomorrow morning, you'll be able to get up and do whatever you need to do. So in these situations where income has been completely cut off and is continuously at risk, we see emotions of stress and tension starting to take precedent. And according to several studies that have been done in several fields of research, it has been seen that women generally tend to stay in abusive relationships during times of economic hardship, and intimate partner and domestic violence also tend to soar during times of economic <coughs> hardship. In such instances, women are not only fo forced into exploitative relationships, as mentioned earlier, but gender-based violence can also manifest psychologically in these situations. Gender-based violence is also exacerbated if we think of issues like period poverty or the basic lack of access to necessary resources. 
When I was given this opportunity to share my ideas with you, I knew this is what I wanted to talk about. But for me, I wanted this to be the most convincing talk that it could be. And for a talk to be convincing for me at the time, I needed statistics. I wanted to show you numbers just so that this relationship could be as clearly presented as possible. And so I ravaged the internet. I looked at reports, I called people, I tried to find data, but the real data I found was few and far between. And for me, that was yet another indicator of our failure as a global community to not only look at climate change as a multifaceted issue, but for our failure to look beyond the larger community that we occupy when we're speaking about climate change. So you may be asking, what exactly is her call to action today? I don't expect to have inspired the next generation of climate activists or gender-based violence activists. What I hope to have done is redirect awareness and conversation towards a group that's occupying a minority intersection. And what I hope to have done today is allow you to push yourselves beyond thinking within the larger community. Whatever issue you may be passionate about, are you thinking about the minority that is occupying an intersection that is being directly affected by that issue? Hopefully, when we're able to think beyond our larger community and connect the dots further and wider, we'll be able to say that as a global community, we are dealing with global issues holistically and inclusively without forgetting the people who are not part of the larger community. Thank you.